The Endocrine Society has partnered with Convey Med to have our family of podcasts, including the Endocrine News Podcast and our Journal Club Podcast, Endocrine Feedback Loop, featured on their app. If you'd like to listen through the app, be sure to download the Convey Med app and search for Endocrine News Plus. You'll find all our episodes there. This is Endocrine Feedback Loop. I am your host, Chase Hendrickson, and welcome you to this Journal Club podcast series brought to you by Endocrine Society. Thanks for joining us as we explore an important article recently published in one of the Society's clinical journals. Welcome back to the Endocrine Feedback Loop podcast for our 36th episode. For this edition of the podcast, we review a recently published article from the JCENM that utilizes common diabetes metrics to attempt to predict mortality in individuals hospitalized with COVID-19. These results could inform our practice for COVID and beyond as they attempt to better understand and quantify the body's response to critical illness. It is an observational study, so we will do our usual careful consideration of the methodology to try to understand how the authors came up with their conclusions and whether they are well-founded. Before introducing the rest of our team today, I will remind you that I host the Endocrine Feedback Loop podcast and work as a general endocrinologist at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, directing our outpatient endocrinology clinics and serving as an associate director for our fellowship program. Joining me again today as our regular contributor here in our virtual recording studio is Allison Myers. She works at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the Montefiore Medical Center, where she is a general endocrinologist and the associate chair for diversity, equity, and inclusion in their department of medicine. Her research focuses on diabetes, particularly on diabetes technology and disparities in care of individuals with diabetes. Our guest expert today is Cecilia Lo Wong from the University of Colorado, where she works as a diabetologist. Among her many roles there, and importantly for our purposes today, she directs their glucose management team. Her research focuses on inpatient diabetes as well as the intersection of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So, as you can easily tell, the perfect pair of endocrinologists joins me today to help unpack this article. As is also always the case, everything we discuss will be our opinions only and not necessarily those of our respective institutions or of the Endocrine Society. Today, we review glycemic gap predicts mortality in a large multi-center cohort hospitalized with COVID-19. The Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism published this report in March 2023. The authors hail from multiple institutions on the East Coast of the U.S., with Marie McDonald from the Brigham and Women's Hospital serving as the first author. At this point, I will hand things off to Allison. She will highlight the key points made by those authors in their introduction. Along with that, she and Cecilia will overview important aspects of the background that we need to keep in mind as we read this paper. Allison? Thank you, Chase. Appreciate it. Today's article is near and dear to me as I was involved in the inpatient management of diabetes during the first surge here in New York City. So I'm well aware of how this was a very impactful article and this topic was very important. We actually had done a study too at our institution, uh, Northwell Health, my previous employer, where we looked at multiple hospitals to see how can we predict mortality and poor outcomes in our patients with diabetes? Is it the hemoglobin A1C? Is it the glucose? As we'll talk about later, potentially it's the glycemic gap that we need to be considering. In our study, we had about 3,900 patients that were admitted with diabetes during the first surge. We specifically looked from January 1st until May 1st. And what we looked to see is in all patients who had an E11 diagnosis code, ICD-10, as well as a positive PCR for COVID-19, was there an increased risk of mortality? Was there an increased risk of needing ventilation? Also, what were some of the risk factors that we could use to predict people who have these poor outcomes? We looked specifically at hemoglobin A1C as well as the serum and point-of-care glucose within the first 24 hours to see also if those or other lab measurements such as ESR could be used to predict morbidity and mortality. At that time, most of the studies were just coming out of China, which was a very homogeneous population of 100% Chinese patients. So we wanted to see where some of the effects that we were noticing in that Chinese population also occurring in our patients. And in our study, roughly 60 to 70% of our patients were non-white, majority of which was identified as African-American mixed or other. We also had a pretty good number of people who identified as Hispanic ethnicity. And what we found is that in our patient population, we had a median age of 68. Most of our patients did have private or public insurance, 99% to be exact. 
And what we found was that older age was predicted as an uh, increased risk for mortality. In the paper that we'll discuss today, there were some differences in their findings. Our older age group tended to have a median age of 72. Our younger group had a median age of 65. We also found that male gender was increased with a high increased risk for mortality, which again, we'll talk about in this paper as they found some differences there. And we know that ventilation, anyone who was ventilated, there was also an increased risk of mortality. And what we did not find though, was that there was no actual significant difference in terms of race or ethnicity. So it didn't matter what your race or your ethnic group was, that was not a predictor of mortality, nor was the type of insurance, private versus public, or the 1% that were uninsured. We did find that serum glucose definitely was a great predictor. Most of our patients, interestingly enough, had an A1C of less than 9%. So roughly 70-something percent of our population had an A1C of less than 9 The remaining group was greater than 9%. But if your average glucose was higher, that definitely was a great predictor. So this was seen in some other studies. My colleagues here at Montefiore Einstein also found that serum glucose was a better predictor in terms of mortality. And that's why it makes this paper so interesting because it's this million dollar question. Should we be looking at A1C? Should we be looking at serum or point of care glucose? Or were you looking for predictions of health outcomes in patients with diabetes? We know that acute hyperglycemia itself can actually predict outcomes in persons with diabetes because it's associated with increased mortality and morbidity in hospitalized patients. So I'm going to defer to you, Cecilia, to give us a little bit more about that. Thank you, Allison. I think one of the first or earlier studies that showed that acute hyperglycemia with or without diabetes is harmful and leads to poor outcomes in the hospital was published by Dr. Guillermo Ampiras back in 2002, so over 20 years ago. And the really interesting finding from this particular study, which is referenced in the paper, is the markedly increased mortality, not just in patients with diabetes, so it's about twofold increased overall inpatient mortality, but in the newly diagnosed hyperglycemic patients, it was tenfold increased. So it was actually much worse in patients without a known prior diagnosis of diabetes. And so I think the big question was, well, is this just a marker of disease severity or is it something about the diabetes that's a protective factor? What is it? And one of the other more recent papers that was referenced in Marie McDonald's paper was published last year in trauma patients, almost 100,000 trauma patients from 46 trauma centers and looking at acute hyperglycemia in the hospital and clinical outcomes in trauma patients. And one of the most interesting pieces of information from this particular study, I thought, was that there is a separation of patients with diabetes with normoglycemia or hyperglycemia in the hospital. So I actually think that this can help isolate the effects of acute hyperglycemia with or without diabetes. And what was found is that mortality is increased in patients with diabetes with hyperglycemia. But if you look at patients with diabetes with glucose is staying below 180 in the hospital, their outcome measures actually were either similar to those without known diabetes, without hyperglycemia, and only slightly worse. So I think that that's really important information and I think should guide our better practice, but we'll see because I'm excited about this discussion because I think we can learn a lot from glycemic gap as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And we found the similar findings. People who survived their mean glucose was either 165 as a point of care or 171 as a serum. And those that had a higher rate of mortality, their glucose on average was higher than 180. So that's definitely a predictor that we can use. And I guess the other question that comes along is, should we consider acute hyperglycemia as the issue or is it chronic hyperglycemia or both? And that's where the glycemic gap comes into play because you're using both chronicity as well as acuity to determine the outcome for these patients. So one thing that we know is that the A1C is great because you don't have to be fasting. The patients can do it any time of day. It gives you a three-month average. But we know that there are some limitations with using a hemoglobin A1C. And I can say yesterday I saw a patient with sickle cell trait, and this came up in clinic when I was teaching the residents. So Cecilia, would you like to expand upon that? Absolutely. And I think this is always the concern with A1Cs. I think we use it in so many different ways. It's a surrogate measure that the FDA uses when we're looking at approval of diabetes drugs, looking at efficacy. But of course, there are a lot of issues with accuracy of A1C in different clinical conditions, as well as use of medications. And sickle cell anemia is one of them. 
as well as chronic kidney disease, which is so prevalent in many of our patients with diabetes, as well as other causes of high turnover, anemia, et cetera, and use of various drugs. And then of course, A1C is an average. And so that's one of the other things to keep in mind is that it doesn't capture anything about glycemic variability. So in today's paper, one of the things that we always like to talk about first is the hypothesis. So the hypothesis that the authors surmised is that a higher than expected emission plasma glucose level defined by the glycemic gap would be a risk factor for mortality and other poor outcomes during hospitalization in patients with COVID-19. Do you think this is a fair assessment? Yeah, I'll chime in and just say I always like it when there's a hypothesis. I think often we we look at papers and you can we maybe are inferring what a hypothesis might be or we're guessing there. But I, I really like what the authors did here is they really stated it quite well. And, and I think in addition, they didn't include anything in there that they're not looking at specifically. So that these are all things we'll get to them as we look at the methods. And then then after that, as Allison actually walks us through the results. But these are all things that they're looking at directly. So there's really no uh, intermediates that they're, that they're having to use to, to make assumptions with that. So I, I really liked how, how this uh, hypothesis was, was stated by the authors here. I would agree that hypothesis-driven research, even when it's observational, is much more useful in terms of trying to interpret what the analyses were all about and what the authors were trying to test for. So I think the hypothesis itself, of course, this is kind of a make or break. So was it a yes or a no? And I think that that's always an important way to look at information. But I think it was based in a lot of the evidence that's out there. And I think it was great to state it this way. I agree with both of your points. The authors did also highlight the fact that they were looking at demographic, clinical, and laboratory variables that were present on emission in addition to the A1C, the serum glucose, and the glycemic gap. So now we will look further at the methods. Great. Thank you, Allison, for highlighting all those and giving us an idea, along with Cecilia, of some of the background here that we need to be thinking about, the, the, the evidence base that exists currently. So how we're going to look at this, we've mentioned this several times already that this is an observational study. So this is a retrospective cohort study. So I'll do now as we normally do. We've lo- looked at quite a few retrospective cohort studies throughout the podcast, but we'll, we'll talk about it briefly again just to make sure we're all on the same page. So what a cohort study is, and when you have a group of individuals and they have some shared characteristics, sometimes multiple, and, and we'll think about how that works in the study here in just a second. And and then that cohort is then subdivided based on an exposure. And so we'll look at this. We're going to talk a little bit more about this idea of a a glycemic gap, but that's going to be what the exposure is here. And then what makes it a cohort study is that you follow these individuals over time. So you have a larger group. They are subdivided into at least two groups, sometimes multiple based on that exposure. And then you follow them over time to see if one group versus another develops an outcome or outcomes of interest more frequently. And this is a retrospective. So you have two different types of cohort studies. You can have a prospective or a retrospective. And that is just when the study starts. So a prospective study, you design your study before the outcomes have happened. So you have maybe just the exposures and then you follow along with these subjects in real time as you wait for the outcomes to develop. Those are really helpful studies to design because you can define exactly what you want. You can say, we're going to collect this information. We're going to look for this. So you have quite a bit of control about what information you get. They do tend to take a long time as some of these cohort studies can take years. This is a retrospective cohort study. So this is started, the actual investigation is started after all of the data collection has happened. So not only the exposure, but also the outcomes have already occurred. And you're accessing this data. It can be in a database, it can be through a chart review. There's a few different ways that you can do it. They tend to be a little bit easier to do, but the trade-off with that is, is you may not have all the information you want. You may be designing your study and say, well, I wish we had this or wish we had that. But since all the data has been collected, that may not be something that's accessible. So we'll think about that. And that's an important thing to think about with retrospective cohorts is to say, well, what information would we have liked to have seen? So, so we'll think about that as we go along with this one. Okay, now to get into this study. So a little bit more particular about these institutions that were involved here. The five institutions that participated, so you had the Brigham and Women's and the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospitals in Boston. You also had the Rhode Island Hospitals and Lifespan in Providence. You had the University of Miami, and you also had Upstate University in Syracuse. And I want to take a little step in and get some of Allison's perspective here, particularly with some expertise that she brings to the table for us. So, Allison, as, as we were thinking about this study, you, you mentioned a few different times why it's important to be thinking about diverse patient populations, particularly as the population 
populations that we serve are typically diverse and and we need our research to to reflect that. So help us understand from your perspective of why this is important and, and we're going to be thinking about how well this was done in this study, but but in general, why is this such an important concept that we need to be thinking about when we are either designing research or analyzing research that has been done by others? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we need to consider is the fact that diabetes disproportionately affects certain groups. So in this country, we have about 29 million people who have diabetes. But if you're Native American, the rates are a lot higher than if you're white. So Native American, you find a prevalence of about 14.5%, whereas in the white population, it's only 7.4%. So you're twice as likely if you're Native American to develop diabetes. We also know that there are higher rates in people who identify as Black, 12.1%, or Hispanic Latino, 11.8%, or Asian, 9.5%. And then if we look within these groups, remember these groups are not monoliths, we can see that certain populations within these groups have even higher rates. So for people who are from Puerto Rico, people who are from the Philippines, we know that there are higher rates within those subgroups of diabetes. And what we saw was during COVID, these were also the groups that were most affected by COVID. A lot of these groups were our frontline workers, whether they were nurses, delivery people. A lot of them were being exposed to COVID, bringing it home to families. And a lot of these cultures, people live intergenerationally. So you might have grandma, grandpa, mom and dad and kids. And so there was a lot more COVID in these populations. And we saw that there was higher mortality in COVID in people who identified as Native American, Black or Hispanic early on. As time has gone on with vaccinations, improved care, we have seen there were some gaps that have closed. Unfortunately, in the Hispanic Latino population, there's still a big gap between the population and who was tested positive for COVID-19. And that's why it's important that when we have these studies that we're reflecting on the fact that we are matching what we should see in the population. In this particular study, about 54% of the population was white and 18.8% identified as African-American. In terms of ethnicity, 29% identified as Hispanic Latino. It's unclear if some of them might have uh, identified as Black, White, other Asian within that. But there was less of a population than I would have expected, especially in urban areas where you know that people of color are living, places like Miami, places like Boston. Thank you. That, that's really helpful. So we'll come back to that as we get to the results and and, and we'll we'll wrestle with that a little bit more. OK, so a little bit more on, on how this data was collected. So this was extracted retrospectively from electronic health records, and they were looking in particular at individuals who were admitted to the hospital from March of 2020 through February of 2021. And to be a part of the cohort, there were several criteria that you had to meet. So you had to have an admission to the hospital uh, with a COVID-19 ICD-10 code. You also had to have a positive COVID PCR test, and you had to have either established diabetes or have hyperglycemia in the hospital. And then as a final criteria, you needed to have what the authors described as a baseline hemoglobin A1C available. So, so we'll think a little bit more just about that. So let, let's uh, let's go back to the cohort, how you got into this cohort overall. So initially with the cohort, when they looked at uh, those, those first criteria, they had quite a few individuals, so well over 8,000 individuals. And then as they look to say, well, do we who do we have that meets the full glycemic criteria? A bit of a drop off there, so a little over 6,000. But then when they applied that final criteria of needing to have a baseline hemoglobin A1C, and, and with what they meant by that is a, a hemoglobin A1C that was done within three months before the hospitalization or during the hospitalization, there was a big drop off there. So, so that left a final number in the cohort of 1,786 individuals. So Cecilia, I wanted to get your input here. So as we think about the big drop off over 4,000 individuals were lost with that with that inclusion of a criteria. And, and as we'll see, as we talk about a glycemic gap, that is a necessary criteria, you have to have an A1C. But as we think about the impact of that, the, the authors in their discussion mentioned, well, there is a possibility for a selection bias could have been introduced here with that requirement. But but how would you think about this about that requirement and that big drop off of eligible patients in this cohort? One of the biggest questions that comes from having to exclude so many patients from the cohort is how representative is the rest of the patients that were examined? And so how is this group without A1C different from the rest of the group? And can we draw conclusions of the whole group with just a portion? And I think that we can speculate that those with A1C within three months before the hospitalization are more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. And I think that those without an A1C would have been missed if they were at high risk, but not screened. And then I think there's another question that comes up is 
what's the difference among the hospitals in terms of hospital practice? So how frequent is the A1C being checked during the hospitalization? How easy is it to get? And then actually, I would imagine that, um, so for example, our hospital sends out the high A1Cs, and so those are verified. So we don't have a value for the A1C until it comes back from the send out. And so it could be that we're biasing towards A1Cs that are lower. And so I think there are a number of questions about the need to exclude so many patients in order to get the cohort that are being looked at. That's helpful. I think it'll become obvious why the authors had to do that here shortly, um, but something we do need to be thinking about is it could impact the results. Okay, so now we're going to think about the outcomes here. Allison mentioned it in the introduction, but the primary outcome was death during hospitalization. The secondary outcomes were the need for mechanical ventilation or admission to the ICU. And then there were several of what the authors described as exploratory outcomes, and those were length of stay, hyperglycemic crisis in the hospital, hypoglycemia, and treatment with glucocorticoids. So I want us to think about these as a group, and Allison, maybe we'll get your input on this. This, and, and I'll just make as a, a comment before we, we get your thoughts on on these outcomes is I, I do think similar to what Cecilia mentioned already is that there's some potential impact for local practices here. One of the things that jumped out as well, criteria for ICU admission. Well, often we're going to infer from ICU admission that that means you were pretty sick. I think that's the idea of what you're looking for here. But there could be different practice patterns. We're going to look at DKA. That's that's one of the, the items that's looked at here. And it could just be in a lot of hospitals. If you have DKA, you go to the ICU. And, and we don't necessarily, I think, always know that here because there are different patterns that, that aren't elaborated on. So I think one potential limitation there of having ICU uh, admission as an outcome is we don't always know what drives that at different hospitals. But uh, Allison, any other thoughts on, on these sure. outcomes as listed? I think also it would have been nice if they could have teased out the outcomes based on the surges because we did know that during the first surge, the alpha variant ICU was a little bit more loosely used. So patients in DKA didn't necessarily make it to the ICU because we didn't have enough bed space. So sometimes floors were converted to quasi ICUs. So I was just wondering that, you know, if they had looked at the first surge versus the second surge, was there a difference in time just because we know that that strain was much more potent and they had, it was associated with worse outcomes than the second strain. Yeah, that's a good point. Of, of we would have sent them to the ICU if we could have, but we didn't have the uh, ability because there wasn't capacity there. Good. Yeah. Cecilia, any other thoughts on those outcomes? I would agree with what you've already mentioned. And I just wanted to also talk about the fact that the treatment with glucocorticoids, you know, just to go back to change in practice patterns over time, things changed very, very quickly during the pandemic. And once we got the important information that dexamethasone reduced poor outcomes in severe COVID infection with any type of hypoxia, our practice pattern completely changed. And so patients started being treated more with dexamethasone. So I think that was an interesting exploratory outcome to include in this particular study. One other outcome that I was interested in that they didn't include was the medications. Because if you look at, for example, like at the Coronado study, they found that people who use metformin before coming into the hospital had better outcomes. People who were on insulin had worse outcomes. We could argue that it's probably not the insulin that did it. It's probably just that they had poorer control of their diabetes before coming in. But I thought it was interesting that they kind of glossed over the medications. They did pull out the ACEs and the ARBs, but it would have been interesting if they had teased out the diabetes medications that were in use as well. Yeah, and then that's actually a good transition in the exposures, which is where this tends to show up here. So, so first of all, the main exposure, obviously, so what, what is going to put these people into different groups is that glycemic gap. And, and the authors define that as taking a, a, what you would estimate an average glucose based on the hemoglobin A1C, and then comparing that to see what the actual glucose is and the difference there being that glycemic gap. So that's what's going to put you into different groups within this cohort. They did look at other exposures, though, so that they could account for those, and then they described these as predictor variables on admission. So they looked at demographics, age, sex, race, and ethnicity. They looked at BMI. They looked at a host of lab data that we'll think about here in a second. And um, this is where they did look at outpatient diabetes treatment and also other outpatient medications of interest in this group. So in particular, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and statin use. They looked at a host of comorbidities that we're going to wrestle with as well. And, and so I'll ask uh, Cecilia, any other thoughts on exposures that we might've been uh, interested in here? Uh, one thing I think that, that always uh, gets mentioned into socioeconomic status. I think that actually may have had an impact here. Allison alluded to that already as she was helping us understand some potential explanations for disparities in, in, in care. But, but any other exposures that you might've been interested in seeing them look at here? I think that one thing that would have been really interesting, and I know that this is extremely difficult to find from 
electronic health records is type of diabetes. So type one versus type two. We know that there are, of course, many factors and risk factors and other things that overlap, but I think that would have been important to pull out. And of course, we we understand that diabetes is a very heterogeneous condition. And so um, just a little bit more detail about things like duration and things like other types of diabetes would have been great to know. And then I would echo what Allison said that I think treatment of the diabetes, a breakdown of the medications would have been really helpful. Yeah. And I think that's helpful. And again, illustrates what we were talking about before is with retrospective cohort studies, you're often stuck with whatever data you have. And often you'll think, oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. And, and you would have actually looked for it if this was a prospectively designed study, uh, but not always something you're going to have information on. Okay. So a final word on the methodology here with the statistical analysis, just to give a very high level overview of how the authors built a predictive model here. So the first thing that they did is they identified and assessed potential predictors. And that's what we looked at with those exposures before. And then with each of those, they performed a univariate assessment. And then finally, once they gauged the impact of that, they started to combine those to create a multivariable model. So we're going to think about that in this final model that they used is, is what uh, they used to try to uh, predict the mortality and morbidity for these individuals. So uh, at this point now, let's uh, let's switch over to Allison here. She's going to walk us through the re results. A lot of this information that we talked about already is we try to understand uh, the results that were found here. Allison. Our average age of the patients in the study was 65.6 years, which was not surprising because we know that diabetes usually affects people 40 and over. They actually did have a pretty equal distribution of males and females, which is great. However, we did see that their racial distribution was lacking. So I will ask Cecilia and Chase to comment on that. I know I mentioned something earlier about it, but I'm just curious to know your thoughts about the racial distribution of this particular cohort. One of the really interesting points about the makeup of the study population is the, well, first of all, um, the other is quite large. And I think there's, they do have an explanation on who might be included in that population. But I think that's a little bit difficult to interpret kind of the demographics. And one of the things I did notice, and this is, I think, one strength, actually, is that the percent missing is, so quote, only 2.6%. <laughs> so I know looking at some other cohorts, that percentage can be quite a bit higher. So I think one of the strengths is that we actually do know the race of most of the patients who are included in the study. But I think one of the questions is, you know, is this truly representative of patients with type 2 diabetes and those who were affected most by COVID? I think another thing that we can talk about in terms of disparity is the use of BMI. We know that if you identify as Asian, the BMI cutoffs are different than if you're non-Asian. So the mean BMI was 31.5 which doesn't sound like a lot if you're thinking of the American standard of the BMI cutoff being 30, but for Asian patients, when it's 27, you might actually be having more higher rates of obesity than reported because as you mentioned earlier, Cecilia, this is this collapsed group of other, which included multiracial American Indian, Alaska Native, Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander. In addition, the mean A1C was not very high, similar to what we saw in our study, it was 8.1%. So some of these patients may not have chronic hyperglycemia, but they clearly did have acute hyperglycemia because the emission glucose on average was 216. And the mean glycemic gap was 30.6 for these patients. In terms of overall mortality, it was 10.6%. Older age was identified as a risk factor as those who were older actually had a 4% increased risk of death. This was statistically significant, but the question is, is that really clinically significant to us? We also know that sex, race, ethnicity were not independently associated with mortality. And again, this is not always consistent in all the studies. We found that male gender was, but we also did find that race was not, as well as ethnicity. The early studies from China, of course, because the group was homogeneous, you did not see these differences in ethnicity and race, but you did see this male prominence of mortality. So in terms of glucose data, we found from the study that the admission glucose was associated with in-hospital mortality, but A1C was not. When we look at the glycemic gap, we found that if you have a negative gap, your mortality rate was about 7.4%. If the gap was somewhere between zero to 90, it was... 12.7%. And if it was above 90, it was 15.8%. And just keep in mind, again, that the average glycemic gap in this group was 
We know that there was a few other risk factors for increased mortality, DKA and COPD, but it's important to keep in mind that the number of DKA cases was relatively small. In terms of what was protective against mortality was those who had a higher GFR and also those who used outpatient diabetes medications. Again, they didn't go into a lot of detail about which medications people were using. There was some buzz at one point that potentially DPB-4 inhibitors or GLP-1s or even SGLT-2 inhibitors may uh, have an effect on decreasing COVID. But as we saw with the DARE study, the outcomes were not improved by using one of the SGLT-2 inhibitors in patients with COVID-19. So it's still a little unclear about which medications may actually help or hinder for patients with COVID-19 and diabetes. In terms of the secondary outcomes, this is when they used the multivariable model. What they looked at was mechanical ventilation, and they found that those who had a higher glycemic gap, a higher BMI, and of course those who were in DKA, which would make sense clinically, were more likely to require mechanical ventilation. The same factors were found, again, for ICU admission, which also would make sense because many of our patients with DKA, we would send to the ICU even if they did not have COVID, and those with a gl higher glycemic gap also we're more likely to have a higher admission glucose, so that would also make sense. When we look at the exploratory outcomes, there were a few. So there was glucocorticoid treatment, which interestingly enough was actually associated with the hospital death, which I found to be interesting because if you look at the data from the recovery trial, which came out in the summer after the first surge, they found that inpatients with low oxygenation actually had improved outcomes when given dexamethasone. They didn't specifically look for patients with diabetes. However, about 30% of their sample did have diabetes. And so I found it very interesting that in this particular study, they found that the use of glucocorticoids was associated with increased hospitalization of death in the hospital. I do know for us, when we had the first surge, they were trying different types of steroids. So I'm not sure if maybe that was what led to this. I know initially we were using hydrocortisone, prednisone, dexamethasone eventually became used, but they pretty much were trying all of the different methylprednisolone types of studies during the first surge. So I don't know if maybe that was what caused this, but I found it very interesting that this was against the recovery study, which has made dexamethasone the steroid of choice for patients with COVID with oxygen saturation less than 88%. So now we'll turn it back to Chase to talk about the discussion and conclusion. All right. A lot of good points that we're going to want to wrestle with here. So what we'll start with is the author's conclusion. So the way that they stated here is that the glycemic gap is a stronger predictor of in-hospital mortality, need for mechanical ventilation or ICU admission than either the admission plasma glucose or the hemoglobin A1C alone. And then the authors go on to suggest that this indicates the importance of a relative hyperglycemia. So a few other words, we talked about that glycemic gap before. So just thinking about what else is out there in the literature is the authors point out that this glycemic gap has been shown to be predictive in a variety of conditions. Uh, though there's a variable threshold of between 30 and 80. The only comment that I would make there is, is I think th this actually fits. So we often in medicine like to come up with thresholds. It makes it easier to say, well, if you're above this, you have it. And if you're below that, you don't. Um, but really, in, in much of medicine, everything happens on a spectrum. And, and so the more you have of something incrementally, uh, the incrementally worse it is. So, so I don't think it's particularly surprising that there are different thresholds that are identified. Uh, and and I, it wouldn't be surprising at all if there's no true threshold for that effect. You know, back to what the authors point out, they indicate that Apache scores are uh, better predict mortality risk when this glycemic gap is incorporated. And so the author suggests uh, that looking at the literature here, that there's a couple different mechanisms that, that could explain why the glycemic gap is so predictive here. One is they suggest that the glycemic gap could be from worsened inflammation and subsequent insulin resistance. And that makes the glycemic gap a surrogate marker of impaired immunity, assuming that's coming from that inflammation. As a second mechanism, the author suggests that, well, maybe the glycemic gap is actually from acute impairment in insulin secretion. So different cause, but that same result of that gap there. Uh, Cecilia, as you think about this, you think a lot about inpatient hyperglycemia and, and what might be going on with that. Uh, any thoughts that you have uh, or maybe even any speculation on which of these mechanisms seem more plausible or potentially even something else altogether? I think that, of course, from these observational data, it's, it's hard to tell which of the mechanisms is more at play in these patients. And I think that 
both could be very important. I actually think that there's probably a fair distinction to be made between those with known diabetes versus those without diabetes. And so we certainly know that patients with diabetes have decreased beta cell function. And of course, there's compensatory hyperinsulinemia. But I think that in the acute setting, of course, we've seen many patients with type 2 develop DKA. So definitely acute impairment in insulin secretion. But I think that the stress hyperglycemia in diabetes versus no diabetes, it's a really important factor. And I think a lot of that reflects the inflammation and the resulting insulin resistance. But one of the points I did want to make about the glycemic gap is that the initial papers by Liao et al. were actually in patients with diabetes. And so I think that was an attempt to tease out the effect of stress hyperglycemia in diabetes. And so I think that this particular paper extends the glycemic gap into use in patients without diabetes. And so looking at stress hyperglycemia in patients without known diabetes, as well as patients with diabetes. So it may be that we would need to look at glycemic gap differently in patients with known diabetes versus without. Another point that the authors make is talking about uh, what I, they identified as a protective factor. So that's the prescription of standard therapy for diabetes management. And for that one, they offer a couple of different explanations. So one, they suggested that untreated cardiometabolic disease potentially could increase your risk of death. So if you were not being treated with this standard therapy for diabetes, that that is why you had a higher risk of mortality when you came into the hospital because you had untreated cardiometabolic disease. A second explanation that they suggested is, is that potentially the lack of diabetes treatment leads to acute hyperglycemia in the, once you get sick and come into the hospital, and then that is an increase for the risk of mortality that you have. A third explanation that, that I would suggest is this could be a place where residual confounding kicks in. So we talked about this before. Uh, one example would be socioeconomic status. So that's very hard to measure, particularly in retrospective studies. And that could be an explanation of what's going on here. And so they weren't able to measure it. So they couldn't account for it very well in their models. And that could be a bit of an explanation here. Uh, Cecilia, any thoughts that you might have on, on these explanations of why this uh, of individuals being on standard therapy for diabetes management would actually lead to a lower risk? Risk of mortality in the hospital? I think these are all important points. And I think we think of just having the diagnosis of diabetes as triggering more aggressive control of cardiovascular risk factors. And so that certainly could be one of the important um, factors here. But I think that in terms of kind of acute as well as chronic hyperglycemia, I think, you know, standard treatment would be important. But I wonder about this residual confounding. So I think how likely is someone to be treated adequately for their diabetes, to be on standard therapy, et cetera. I think it's an important consideration. Good. And then one final comment here, and this is something that Allison brought up around glucocorticoid use. So similar to uh, Allison being a little surprised about this finding, the authors made, made similar comments. So they point out that glucocorticoid use was associated with an increased mortality, and that was independent of the glycemic gap. Uh, and then the authors also state that that is different than what was seen in the clinical trials, though the authors go on to say is that this might actually represent a higher disease severity. So the reason that you saw that is because only the sickest of the folks were getting the steroids in the first place. And that was what was driving the mortality is that they had a high mortality despite the use of steroids. And, and so the terminology that we would use for that would be confounding by indication, though it, it does raise that question on, on the use of glucocorticoids in hospitalized patients with COVID, uh, particularly those individuals with diabetes. Okay, so as we begin to wrap up the discussion section here, the authors wanted to point out a few different strengths. So they indicated that they were centrally coordinated, and they pointed out that this is a multi-center study, and then they also pointed out that this is a large, diverse population. A few limitations that the authors suggested, so they did point out that they were reliant upon electronic health records and the ICD-10 codes, and, and that they needed to use those. And, and with that, they, they said that they had uh, difficulty sometimes that with prior diagnosis of diabetes that it could not always be assigned with what they described as a high degree of accuracy. They pointed out that while they looked at hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemia could not be assessed. And then finally, something we talked about before is that the requirement for a hemoglobin A1C at baseline may have introduced that selection bias. So in other words, that they may have included those individuals who were engaged in the healthcare system uh, or those individuals who had an unexpected hyperglycemia, but that they may have been excluding individuals who had uh, what was thought to be a stress hyperglycemia. So finally, the author's conclusion, and we'll quote them here as the author state, the glycemic gap defined as admission plasma glucose 
minus estimated average glucose based on hemoglobin A1C is a powerful predictor of poor clinical outcomes in hospitalized people with COVID-19. And then based on that, the authors have a couple of recommendations. So one is they suggest that the glycemic gap should be used to assist with triage. And then finally, they indicate that we should be conducting more studies to determine how to risk stratify and to treat stress hyperglycemia. So we'll, we'll give our final thoughts as we, as we wrap up here. So Allison, why don't you give us a thought, just quality of the study overall. We'll think about these implications here in a second, but just what, is your, what are your thoughts on the quality of this report? I did appreciate what the authors were trying to do because, as noted earlier, there are some limitations with just using the A1C alone. We do know, as stated from uh, Umpierrez's article that uh, Cecilia highlighted, that stress hyperglycemia or related to diabetes or non-diabetes is a predictor of mortality. But it's interesting that we may have something else that we can use to predict mortality as well. I think the authors were good about identifying the fact that it was retrospective in nature, the potential selection bias for requiring the A1C were limitations of the study. But at the end of the day, it would be nice to do like a nice prospective study to get a better idea of the use of this particular measure. But I think this is something that we can use, just like we've seen with CGMs. Now we use time and range and other metrics. So it's nice that we have other things that we can look at to get a better idea of someone's acute as well as chronic glycemic control. Cecilia, thoughts that you have, just quality of this report overall? I would say that in terms of their overall conclusions, I, I think this is really intriguing information. It's hypothesis generating. I don't know that I would call this a powerful predictor. I think that that remains to be seen and needs further study. But I do think that this is an important addition to what we need to be considering in our patients. And so overall quality, it was multi-center a large number of patients, although many had to be excluded. And so really interesting findings. So Cecilia, let, let's stay with you here and, and have you wrap up things for us. So as you think about this, so you run the glucose management team at your hospital at Colorado. And so if say the hospital folks come to you and say, hey, we've heard about this, should we be including the glucose and then how we risk stratify these folks to try to figure out who needs to go to the ICU, who can go to the floor? Uh, what do you think? Should we be doing something with this now or eh, let, let's hold off and, and wait till we actually do conduct some more of those clinical trials to actually understand how and, and to use this information? So I'm not sure I'm ready to triage patients based on the glycemic gap, but I do think that it would be useful to start looking at, and we can actually start looking at this prospectively. And so I think it would be worth calculating, and I'd love any help to try to figure out how best to take care of our patients. It's helpful, but I would need some more information to act on this. I just wanted to add one more thing. You know, this population was skewed because most of these patients had hyperglycemia. So we don't really know how is this going to work in our patients who come in with hypoglycemia. So most of these patients had a positive gap, but what about those who have a negative gap because they come in with a low glucose? Can we assume that they also will have poor outcomes? We really don't know. So I think that's the other good thing about doing a prospective study is to see what will happen for our patients who are on the opposite side of the coin. And with that, I would like to thank Allison Myers and Cecilia Lo Wong for joining me for this month's edition of Endocrine Feedback Loop. I hope that you all learned as much as I did and that you will join us again next month. And now you're in the loop. This has been Endocrine Feedback Loop. Endocrine Feedback Loop is brought to you as a members-only benefit of the Endocrine Society with production oversight by Brandy Brown and Andrew Harmon. The Endocrine Society has partnered with Convey Med to have our family of podcasts, including the Endocrine News Podcast and our Journal Club podcast, Endocrine Feedback Loop, featured on their app. If you'd like to listen through the app, be sure to download the Convey Med app and search for Endocrine News Plus. You'll find all our episodes there.